you know, I, I'm, I'm happy to see this sort of this much ferment around creative coding, but it's quite an old thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and there, are, there are many, you know, sort of forgotten pioneers or semi-forgotten pioneers who are out there in the 1960s, you know, these algorist guys. Uh, you know, and, and, and as soon as there's a success, you know, things begin boiling out of the woodwork and uh, things will be valorized in kind of retrospect. And I always find that really amusing and touching, you know, I don't know. I mean, it's the, it's the classic cyberpunk dictum that the future is already here. It's just it hasn't been distributed. Okay, well, you know, it hasn't been distributed for 40, maybe 50 years <laughs> in the case of creative coding. Uh, stuff that's going on you know, I think the new thing about it is social networking, because you could be a guy who's just, you know, doing hobby programming on your PC or, you know, even your like your university mainframe. And, you know, maybe you would convince somebody to put on a show of your graphic printouts or something. But it was just very difficult for there for to to um, put together, you know, a group of interested parties who really knew what you were doing and genuinely sympathize and could appreciate what you were doing. And, you know, there really aren't that many regional areas where there's enough of a critical mass of people to appreciate it. But once you have social networking, you can start pulling out the two guys, the five guys, the seven guys, the, the lone genius, and somehow agglomerate them into groups like, uh, you know, Free Art and Technology Lab, which are, you know, 19 guys in probably 25 cities. I haven't tried to count them. But... You know, nowadays people tend to have several cities all by themselves, but they nevertheless are, um, they just have a, you know, a social network platform for development and criticism that has always been missing, you know, and now, but all of a sudden, uh, over the past two or three years, you've got enough people doing it that they can advance stuff, they can sort of talk about what they're really doing, they can make a difference on the ground, they can share code, they can find places to put it on, they... They've, they've got a nucleus of people. It reminds me of the, and, um, you know, as, as kind of alternative art scenes go, it's very, very important to have these small but effective kind of tide pools where, where things, can, uh, things can sort of cross over and, and, and interbreed and boil and then like burst out into, into larger venues. Well, you're starting to touch look that different, but they do look like, geeks with more of a design sense. And, you know, and there are certain things they do. I mean, you know, like the Mac laptop covered with stickers. That's very sad. question. And, you know, I, I guess the kind of ultimate version of that phenomenon is Wikipedia, where you got like all these guys kind of piling up wiki stuff. And then you have these wiki bots that sort of run around getting rid of the, like, you know, the, the, the ceaseless attacks. So, you know, if you're going to do social networking online, it has to be at least somewhat partially automated. So you've got to have a place, you know, a GitHub or some kind of, you know, cluster. We can just sort of like toss the old code in there. And it has to be more or less bulletproof because there's always some moron or, you know, Chinese super spy or anonymous guy or whatever the villain of the week is out there trying to knock it down or pollute it or free ride on it. So, you know, I do this. How do I get there, wrap it up in a tar ball, drag it out, open it up, show it to other people? Um, how do you keep things from forking? And uh, you know, none, none of those things work without people, because if you just have a code archive and nobody looks at it, it just sits there taking up disk space. But if you have just the people and you don't have the tools for them to accrete around, they just end up having a beer and gossiping. They don't really get anything done. And it, and, you know, code is not stable like analog media. It's something you can tinker with and then throw back. You know, you're, you're sort of constantly mutating things. It's not like, I mean, in, in, in newspapers, you can't like constantly rewrite articles over and over again. You write a new newspaper, but you can't continually improve some particular piece of stuff. And, and you know, people start these things and they don't seem to have much of an idea as to which are going to be big successes and which are just going to sit there as curiosities. Well, I, I don't think that it has its own volition, but neither do I think that the coders are in control. So, so you know, it's more like gardening or hunting and, 
And I, I'd, I'd, I'd like hark back to Brian Eno on this. I mean, he's done a lot of generative stuff in the old lab there. And he's kind of a, you know, classic engineer tinkerer thing. And if he finds something interesting, he just sort of like draws a circle around it and says, well, that was the target and I hit it, you know, and then you ship it. And that's like, you ship it. And that's like sort of like getting the old prize pumpkin. And I was like, I'm a pretty good pumpkin farmer. And, you know, I have good years and I have bad years. But it's not like I engineer pumpkins. I kind of know where the seed is. And, you know, I know a few certain pumpkin growing tricks. But, you know, there's a certain amount of randomness. And you can't, like, move the volition onto the pumpkin and then say, well, you know, the pumpkins are stubborn this year. Because that just, um, it's anthropomorphism. You know, it's like voodoo. And that's not how machinery works, and it's not how software systems work. They aren't, they aren't entities, you know, they're not like Japanese Kame, they're just code. Um, so, you know, if I were a writer who had that kind of chops, I'd be wanting to do something that was like deconstructive, you know, or some kind of like software studies, humanities level heavy iron, or just like, feeding in, say, the entirety of Albanian literature and then looking to see if there's like any deep underlying lexical kind of, okay, you know, there's some of that going on. There's a software studies group in University of California, San Diego. You know, I follow what these guys are doing. I can't read all their papers. Some of them are a little baffling for me. But, you know, I'd be the kind of guy who goes out and has like a gigantic supercomputer center with one million Japanese manga comics covers <laughs> just kind of like crunched up and like thrown up on these giant walls all at once. OK, that's not really that far away. Right. But but doing things with writing is not necessarily as interesting as doing things with video or with manufacturing or with, you know, immersive, interactive environments. I mean, there are things you can do with text that are elaborate and kind of revealing in some ways. I mean, Twitter is making a living out of this. You can data mine stuff, number crunch things, look for trends, Google trends. And there's a lot of this going around. Some of it is academic. Some of it is industrial. But it definitely has an effect on writing. And... Um, it even has an effect on people on the way people uh, express themselves. But doesn't writing have the best years? And you know, a lot of the stuff that we pride ourselves on that's been around for long was basically preserved accidentally. I mean, somebody left it in a jar or they left it in the basement of a monastery. And, you know, things that we try to preserve often get destroyed because somebody shows up with a bomber or, you know, a torch and just sets fire to the library because... You know, or, or it's destroyed in an earthquake. And then we have things like, uh, you know, the Dead Sea Scrolls that are basically just abandoned. Okay, you can't really do that with code. I mean, if you abandon code and nobody upkeeps it and it doesn't migrate on a new platform or into new languages, it's pretty likely to end up in the snowball jar. You know, it's just nobody's going to go there with it. So is there a sense? Right. Well, you know, everybody's always like using these far-fetched metaphors. You know, like, it's alive. It's this, it's that, or the other. You know, it's a fine art. No, it's a floor wax. No, it's a dessert topping. I wish we could talk about it in a much more direct way. You know, it's just like, okay, it's code. It's executable. I mean, I think generative art can be beautiful. And, you know, I think there are certainly things that code does that can speed up processes that otherwise would be impossible. And I think there's like areas of production that can be reached through code that would be basically impossible through any analog method. I mean, Casey Reed, I mean, Casey Reed says, you know, code's great at doing five or six things. They're like simulation, replication, you know, recursion. Okay, you know, you can't really do a lot of simulation with a fountain pen, kind of, you know. You could draw somebody's picture, but it doesn't do anything. You know, it doesn't actually behave in the way that another system behaves. So, you know, at the, at the lowest level, it's like a bunch of blips moving around on a little racetrack. You know, it's just, it's just ones and zeros moving through a processor. And processors are really beautiful, intricate objects. They're too small for the human eye to see, but they're gorgeous. I mean, they're, they're like urbanscapes. You know? and, these, uh, 
And the this, this sort of ones and zeros, I mean, the idea that these things are passing through these endless numbers of gates, there's something profound about that, you know, just this kind of, this kind of, you know, elemental activity on the level of, 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 of the metal surface. You know, it, it's almost like, uh, it's like the microbial world, you know, it's like the intricacy of something under a microscope. And you look at it and you think, you know, gosh, these like small fuzzy things, they really dwell within us, you know, they're kind of pervasive and, uh, you know, and there's a kind of, um, you know, majesty to that, really. So beautiful. And, you know, mathematics is beautiful. I mean, the fact that it kind of does simulate reality and it adds up in some ways and it's kind of verifiable and you can grasp it with a mental effort and you realize it has to be this way, it can't be in the other way. And there's some kind of, some kind of element of truth to it. You know, it's kind of the bare Euclidean beauty of mathematics is beautiful. Um, but it's a stark beauty and not really a sentimental one. Uh, I don't know, hanging out and having people mess with code is kind of interesting. I mean, it's a tough grind. I mean, writing grocery code isn't romantic. But, you know, writing art code actually is something like an intellectual adventure. You can see that people get into it. They're kind of, it changes them somehow, you know. They take on these habits of thought. They get good at it. They're proud of what they can do. They really are craftsmen. They seem to enjoy showing it off. You know, they're, they're aware of being, a, you know, an intellectual elite, really. It's a difficult thing to do code well. Guys who are really, really good at coding are like 10 times better than normal coders. They're like, they're like painters who are really good or, you know, top class athletes who are really good. And, you know, that, um, you know, it is a form of self-expression. And, uh, you know, there, there's something gratifying about just seeing somebody who's obviously got an important game and is visibly on top of their game. Yeah. I'm a big, uh, big fan of his. Really like his work. Actually, I like his thinking. You know, I, like yeah. his, I like his critical writing. Yeah. I mean, I don't really need that many MakerBot plastic doodads. <laughs> One is plenty. <laughs> Do you have any Mary Swats? Right. So I don't really have to know everything about everything. I'm just sort of like going out and looking for people who are pushing things into particular directions. And a lot of the driving forces that I'm most interested in actually do apply across wide areas. Like, so you've got like generative art coding in graphics or, or you know, a, a fabricator manufacturing. But in, uh, but in uh, architecture, you've got parametrics, which is, you know, doing the same thing. I mean, they're like applying these digital methods to create new forms and new, new methods of assembly and new means of production, right? So, right? so I'm always super interested to see them like fight with each other. I mean, a lot of it's trivial, but all art fights are in some sense trivial, you know? And, and in some other levels, they're like, they're just very powerful. I mean, they're like deeply powerfully allied and changing things in very specific ways, which, you know, at a distance from the, from the battlefield is like very obvious. I mean, obviously, obvious. I mean, obviously, parametrics is like closely associated with things like fabrication software. You know, and just one is on a small scale, and the other is the size of a building. One you don't have to. Uh, they used to call it the digital revolution. It's just the digital status quo now, or you know, in our era. So you know, I look for these driving forces, and then when I like move into some new field, like say the military. Uh, I will also look to see what they're doing there, and that's the whole aspect. I mean, most people who are interested in design really like nice designed objects. They have good taste, right? I mean, they want things to like look beautiful and functional. You know, and I'm aware of that, but I don't really care. I mean, I I don't really very interesting. So you know, I'd say that things that are objectively weird are things like the age of the universe, the size of the universe the laws of nature, you know. I mean, they would be startling, I think, to kind of any intelligent entity under any conceivable circumstance. Whereas stuff like circumstance, whereas stuff like gay sex, not really all that weird, you know. And there have been long, long periods in human history where something like gay sex 
was so unbelievably weird, shocking, and offensive that even speaking about it in public was enough to get you burnt at the stake. You know, it was like literally like witchcraft. And then a period could seem weird. Like I could describe how weird fax machines are, you know, and you'd be like, what? They send images around the world in fractions of a minute. Okay, they're extinct. You know, they're not. The, well, really, it's like the poet said, uh, Blake, you know, uh, infinity in a grain of sand. You now, a grain of sand's weird. And you know, if you, like, get close enough to it and start really studying it, like, really get into this grain of sand, you know, it's like the structure of the molecules and the quartz. Okay, it is infinite. But if I go out to the sand pit in the backyard with a bunch of five-year-olds, I'm not going to tell them, hey, you've got 40 trillion infinities in there, you know, because it's just banal, right? I mean, when it comes to aesthetics or things like code, I mean, it's very common. I mean, you know, things like fractal graphics. When they first came out, they looked very psychedelic. And people emphasize their mind-blowing aspects. And they're just, they're things that people do when they consider things to be mind-blowing. And they present them the same way over and over and over again. Spiky, garish, clashing colors, you know, blurry parts to it, uh, you know, optical illusion kind of tricks. Okay, those are like really exciting if you're 17 year old, naive and high on marijuana. Other than that, that's not really very artistic, okay? It's just kind of, you know, new forms of digital art tend to do this because they're associated with advances in high technology. So you're bringing out some big new shiny gadget and the gadget's got all kinds of awesome buttons on it, red, green lights, whatever. So you're looking at your means of production and you're thinking, oh, you know, I'm going to come up with this thing that's like even more wow. But then you get um, where, you know, he makes synthesizers sound like nothing like synthesizers at all. They, they don't sound high tech. They sound like crickets or breezes in the woods or honey dripping or just, you know, or just, they're just in spaces of oral whateverness where he's like managed to escape this kind of chrome plated fanboy obsession with the hardware and actually like gotten into what sound sounds like, right? So you know, robot vision glitch core kind of, you know, machines as our friends, you know, just kind of new ways, novel ways of viewing the world. Uh, through, uh, they'll do anything, weird, blurry cameras, freaky looking microscopy, uh, you know, glitches, bizarre reflections in windows. I mean, just anything that sort of had that feeling, uh, which is a very thing to people. Now you can sort of say, you know, I am like code art guy and I'm into like machine assisted visuals with a new aesthetic. And all of a sudden it's like, wait a minute, come in here, have a sandwich. You know, what can we do for you here in Brazil, sir? Right? And that really is like, it's like raised the bar. I mean, it's given people a new way to approach what they're doing. And it's broken their slavery to specific means of production, specific means of distribution. And especially this just kind of shiny tech boy jackdaw thing, where I've got to have the HD DLSR by next Tuesday, or I'm not really in the game, you know, and that's kind of the kiss of death to getting anything, you know. Like, did you take the picture or did the camera take the picture? So there's got to be some kind of Walter Benjamin intentionality in there somewhere. And if you can back away from it and sort of say, I'm not just the technician at the soundboard, but by somebody who's like exploring this, you know, you're, you're in a much stronger creative space. Work per se. I mean, I think you could spot trends without being particularly creative about it. You don't create trends. I mean, what you do is you see them and you like sum them up and valorize them, or you might curate them and, as and assemble them and show them to people. And I think, okay, and that could be, that can rub people the wrong way because it makes them feel kind of out of it. But, you know, that's the sort of inherent goal of trendiness, trendier than thou, right? <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, that, that's, that's something of a double-edged sword. I mean, you know, you could be trendier than that, but if you're trendier in some direction that nobody gives a damn about, who cares? You know, go out and so, um, I mean, criticism is not the same as creativity. And, you know, I'm a critic and I'm also a creative writer, and I don't think they're really the same thing. What you want out of criticism is like a tool set or a set of approaches or, you know, 
uh, a kind of grid work so that you don't have to reinvent yourself every morning. You can kind of think, you know, okay, I did this thing yesterday and now I'm better at that. So let's try this other variation and see if we can advance it along some particular line of development. And in the development. And in the history of art movements, those lines of development usually last about seven years. I mean, even if you're great, if you're cubism, if you're the pre-Raphaelites, you know, Art Nouveau, seven years, okay? And then after that, it's on cigarette packs and everybody knows what that particular kind of whiplash line looks like. Nobody's surprised to see two eyes on the same side of the model's head. You know, the, the, uh, the uh, novelty value is just gone. Your society will assimilate things like that. You know, but, um, you know, art history is probably a lot more useful than trend spotting. Just having the ability to like go back and see how things replay themselves over and over again and kind of rhyme. That's actually a lot more useful than sort of saying, oh, the color fuchsia is really in for 2014. Actually, it's the, it's the, actually it's, the, it's the color orange that's really in. In case you didn't know that, it's like orange all over the place right now. I don't know why. It's like the waning of the moon. You know, you know, we I think we do have a tech art aesthetic waiting for us. And it'll probably be a big deal by the end of this decade. And you're just gonna have to like watch a bunch of boomers die. And then you're gonna see, you know, a new generation of people move into the art, you know, the power structure of the art scene. And they're actually a lot more comfy with these kinds of, you know, ways. And I think it's gonna be as inevitable as like the spread of techno music, which is, you know, now really a mainstream music, not everywhere in the world, but there are certain places where it really dominates. Berlin, for example, you go to Berlin, it's like techno in Berlin is like jazz in New Orleans. It's just kind of like all over the place. Okay, you're going to see sin foot traffic, seven year olds like it, 70 year olds like it. You know, installations are like super popular. People who used to be afraid of them. Now they'll just charge right up to them. It's like, you know, where's the screen? They're doing the wave, you know, the sort of standard interaction wave and then like wait for it to happen. And like the seven year old comes up and he hops, you know, and something happens like, oh look, he made it happen. You know, and everybody sort of clusters over there. You know, people have like grown accustomed to it. They really like it. They all have it. What kind of more vivid and socially naturalistic expression is waiting for us when we really get on top of these tools. And, you know, it's anybody's guess, but it's gonna look right. Well, you know, I've been speaking about this camera, the future for it must just be 25 years now. So, you know, it's a, it was a, a little seminar that was being held by guys from, what the hell were they? National Endowment for the Arts? Oh, well, they were DARPA guys, I guess. They had some DARPA money. And they were talking about petabyte computers. So what are you going to do with like petabyte computers? And of course, now we have petabyte computers. But back in the days, it was like, oh, these are amazing. Imagine the sci-fi potential. So, you know, potential. So, you know, imagine the sci-fi potential of a camera that's just all lens, right? It's just a globe and the whole thing's a lens. And uh, it just collects every photon that hits its surface and routes it through some kind of charge couple device and then exports that stream as wireless broadband off to some lumbering, you know, Amazon cloud that just sits there and like catalogs this, condenses it, breaks it up and turns it into streams. Okay, at that point, you just like create photographs out of that stream, right? Because you just got every photon in the area. So if you want to take a picture of the wall over there, you just draw a frame around the wall freeze the stream at that moment. And, you know, probably tart it up a little bit just in order to make it look better than it did. It's like, you can, I mean, there are ways to composite this already. Just I'll, I'll feed the entire day through there and I'll pick out, you know, the most used tints and like fill the pixels with that. Okay, it wouldn't be. I mean, if you had one of those and I was a futurist and you said, so what about the future of my black spherical, no moving parts camera? I'd say, oh, in the future, there'll be nano. There'll be tiny, tiny cameras. You say, how is that even possible? Why the wavelength of light? Would something something like, I'll fake it, right? Like, oh, we're gonna worry about that. It's just like, we turn them into dust and we like paint them in the walls and then we like spread them. We're just like a radio telescope. We like, we just invent the wavelengths of light while we're doing, okay, it's not hard to do, all right? 
mean, it, it's hard to do if you... And um, quite commonly, people come up to me and say, yeah, you know that thing you did in that speech? I've got one right here in this cardboard box. You know, and they haul it out, and it's never what I said. It's not even close. They were just inspired by something they heard or, you know, misunderstood or, or, or understood better than I was saying, and then they come up with some lash-up, and, you know, they're happy as clams about it, and I've learned to be just, just sort of be polite about it, you know. As long, I, I would describe your medium there as a lash up. Uh, no, obviously it's a lash up because you got like two different devices. You got like your digital Canon EOS and you got your Xbox 360. And they're on a tripod, but they're like literally united with rubber bands. So, you know, I mean, they've got two methods of vision. I can see just by looking at them that they've got, one of them has a very, very powerful and sophisticated lens. And the other one has this, you know, rather, rather, uh, more primitive game style lens, but I could see that it's got infrared coming out of it because I can actually see the LEDs through the through the knob over there. So clearly you've got two data streams and you've come up with like some software method to like mash them up, right? So your software mash up is kind of the software equivalent of your hardware lash up where you've got it literally held together with rubber bands. And you know, rubber bands are fine things. I mean, whatever works for you guys. Uh, um, you know, I've seen a lot of game devices. They tend to have a pretty short lifespan. They're built with a uh, very definite kind of um, planned obsolescence involved because you really want the teens to grow up and have their little brothers demand the new ones so you can kind of keep in the steady revenue stream. So, you know, a device like that has basically got the lifespan of a pet mouse. And the one on top of it has, you know, maybe the lifespan of a cat. If you really measure it but they are both temporary devices and you know so i'm kind of happy to see them here but i've seen their brothers and sisters and grandmothers and grandparents and they're all in gigantic radioactive black plastic heaps somewhere in rural china being beaten to death with meat grinder hammers by wheezing chinese grandmothers who are picking the germanium out of the tracks okay so that's the fate of these devices um so you know i'm happy to see them uh if i were and uh, God help those guys when they, their little gizmo gets reverse engineered. Oh. oh, I mean, I like Xboxes. Not that I own them, I'm not a gamer. But I just started getting tons of stuff over the transom at my blog about guys hacking with them, you know, and repurposing them. And like finding new things to do with them. And that was super exciting. You know, and then there was like a little political scandal there, you know, within Microsoft. Is like, are we going to like nail this thing down or let these like morons do whatever they want with it? You know, and that's kind of like story like that kind of writes itself, you know. What do you do with it? Well, I'll tell you, uh, you know, I'm almost 60 years old. So I would predict or, you know, I would surmise that let's say it's 20 years from now. And, you know, I've got the usual, like, of uh, retinal degeneration, and I'm pretty hard of hearing. But the, the uh, uh, descendant of this device is in the room. Okay, at that point, I just want, like, complete gestural control system. I basically want one of them mounted at each wall, kind of up in the corner, and I want everything within my domicile to be registered. Just sort of visu visually ubiquitous. And it's just going to sit there, piping the location of every object, my blue tortilla chips, my hot sauce. I don't doubt I'll still be eating them, even though they'll do out my 80-year-old digestive system. So, you know, I don't want to, like, haul my devices around because my shoulders are kind of giving out. I basically want it to watch me and, like, see if I've fallen over and can't get up. And also to just find things because I'm getting a little foggy. So I just, I just want to, like, wave my hands, like, where are the blue corn tortilla chips? You left them under the bed. How did they get under the bed? Well, run this back. You see this? It's like you were like reaching over for your pornography collection and you accidentally kicked the corn chips under the bed. Oh my God in heaven, what else is under the bed? Well, you know, you're an old man. You never go under there. There's a cat. He died under there. Why don't you tell me the cat was dying? I'm just a camera. I'm not an artificial intelligence. You never looked under the bed. I look under the bed. You know, I'm a camera. Okay, that's augmented ubiquity, right? Perfect time. It was like a hand dryer, right? I mean, just like imagine the set of infrared hand dryer stuff you got for towel dryers, just like built into everything. And it doesn't have to be, it doesn't even have to be built into it. It just has to look at it. It doesn't even have to look at it constantly. You could just sweep around like a radar system and kind of like mop it up, 
every once in a while, right? You know, if you're looking for a kind of logical extreme of what you're doing here, I mean, given that I can like move my hands around and sort of like claw my way through these grids and particle clouds, why doesn't that have some physical consequence? Why can't I just like get my granddaughter's pictures, you know, or call the cab, right? Or even just have my liver scanned. And it's like, look inside me now. It's like, how'd you do that? Well, you know, just go ahead, you know, pull out the infraviolet, the ultrasound, whatever. Run it down, whatever scale you need to do, big, low. I mean, we're just mind hoven. We're talking about cities built on this level. Urban augmentation, right? Like, what would it be like to live in where instead of being under constant video surveillance like you are in London right now, you're under constant Xbox surveillance, but really good, really high. Not just three-dimensional, but like four-dimensional. Like you run it back in time, maybe even forecast it. Right? Why would you need a mobile device? Your hand is your mobile device. You just point, gaze at things, wipe at them, swipe at them, pull them in. You know, minority report style, whatever. Really. I mean, building in these switches, devices, objects, material goods. If I can just dematerialize practically everything and use code instead, the costs crash. You know, materiality vanishes. And when the, and the, I just wrote this piece about this imaginary future city. People don't even have homes. They just sketch out space with their hands and then sleep there. I know. The city knows who they are, knows how, what they can afford, the kind of place they ought to be in. They just can like hand wave their way in. Like, here's your mat. We'll have a robot bring you an umbrella. I don't know. You've been giving a on these subjects. Uh, so yeah, there, there wasn't just one, one cyberpunk idea. In fact, you know, we usually have a shotgun approach of kind of, what if that's completely wrong? And what if you tried it the other way? You know, there's a, even a, a pretty good anthology that came out recently in which, what would the world be like if uh, personal computers and the internet had never happened? And that's a, actually an exciting speculative idea right now. So, so, you know, it's not that you have one idea and the world becomes like that. What happens is you have a bunch of ideas and you become famous for some of them. And then some of them have some kind of connection to reality. And then reality just keeps right on going on. So you can be predicting the future in 1975 and it looks kind of more or less like 1985. And that's kind of great. But that's 2015. That was 30 years ago. Who cares if you predicted 1985 and 1975? It doesn't help you in this situation now. So, so, you know, Gibson's written these books recently where he talks about everted cyberspace and cyberspace is becoming a kind of geolocative thing. You know, and I think that's like insightful. And it's not that we're going to get cyberspace and brain plugs, but we are getting something like this kind of Gibsonian everted cyberspace. And I was describing it earlier as augmented ubiquity. But what the heck does that mean? You know, you know. I mean, we don't really have the words and the terminology for it yet, but I do, I do think we're getting a kind of 3D spatial computation. Part of it's because we're getting 3D spatial video. You know, not just like 3D like special effects movies, but the kind of 3D where I can like trace the movement of a fingertip in space with the, with the accuracy that I can a cursor or any other kinds of means of interaction. And that's gonna make a lot of difference. And it's not something that we cyberpunks ever talked about much in the 1980s because it was just too far away to see. So in tech art, by all means, do not marry these devices. They really do have the lifespan of hamsters. So, you know, you, you, you just have to be aware that you're like the hamster herder, you know? You're in the herd and cats business. There's gonna be lots more cats I could sit here naming dead ones for the next hour and a half. And, and no, that's the milieu in which tech art people work. It's really, really an unstable milieu. It's very fast moving. There's a lot of possibility there, but it's gonna be very, very hard to build monuments in that space. And you're really, really gonna have to learn to be clever about it and kind of be able to sort of zoom in and out of it, you know, to take a big view, pull back, 
learn where to put your poker chips, learn how to like throw away a hand that doesn't work and not get stuck with particular labels. You know, if you're, you know, if you're somebody who's 25 years old today and you're like an Xbox hacker, you're gonna be like living 50 years from now. You know, I mean, you know, the, 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 the milieu, the 2060s, is practically unimaginable. I mean, I've written books set in the 2060s. I've like, made an effort, but they're so weird that people can't get their heads around them. And they're much less weird than the actual 2060s are going to be. You know, it, it, it's, it's good to sort of understand what it is that makes you happy about it. You know, why do you want to engage with it? You know, I mean, what is it within yourself that's going to enable you to get out of bed 15 years from today with a kind of undimmed enthusiasm, you know? Like, yeah, you know, every day is a gift, right? And uh, that's, you know, you have to find this sort of inner wellspring, and it requires a kind of self-understanding that, you know, not everyone has, and that's not easy to get. Could you clap for a second? Um, and if you're obsessed by tactics, then you'll become like, you know, the sort of otaku geek figure who gets it about everything, but is basically building ships and bottles and is just, you know, the master of inane things. You know, you just sort of, you get lost at the level of detail and sort of lose, you redouble your effort as you lose sight of your goal. So just, I pity them. I mean, I join them in a minute, really. They are being suffocated by the ancient brains. It's horrible to see. Like guys of the older generation haven't had a single new idea since 2008. It's kind of horrifying. Do you, you, you must feel intelligence. You really need to stop talking about computation as if it were a cognition and stop talking about code as if code is your secret friend. Because, you know, I think that was a good idea, an interesting kind of probe when Turing was thinking about it 50 years ago. But there's like eyewitness accounts of Turing reading this paper and just laughing uproariously. He thought it was some kind of weird joke. It was like putting things over on the metaphysicians. And it was kind of like physicians. And it was kind of like Duchamp's urinal, you know? It was like, so are these machines really think? Uh, well, look, this toilet's an artwork. You know, and it just like caused people's brains to freeze because machines don't think. I mean, they have all kinds of behavior that, that, you know, embodied cognition doesn't do. So, and they're not because, you know, Wikipedia isn't a crowbar. You know, Wikipedia is like a social collective intelligence that has, a, a, you know, a substrate of machine behavior or, or co-behavior under it. So, you know, people come in there and they're like constantly doing stuff and kind of like expanding it here and tinkering with it there. And then there's like relentless attacks and the bots just come by and remove them, right? So you can look at Twitter, right? So you can look at Twitter and you say, oh, well, Twitter is my friend. He's like the little blue bird. Okay, Twitter isn't the little blue bird. That's not what's interesting about Twitter. What's interesting about Twitter is these relationships of people throwing stuff up on Twitter, you know, and just like, doing this, the, forming these little, uh, you know, voluntary networks of people who are spreading news and ideas. And so, you know, I, I'm quite intimate with Twitter, but I don't want to like put it on a pedestal and start saying it's my secret friend because that's like the road to mental breakdown and it actually gets in the way of doing anything with this thing, you know? So, okay, well, you know, 30 years ago, those are kind of fresh and exciting ideas, but they haven't lasted the test of time. There is no Vingian singularity we're not anywhere near a singularity. We're near a massive climate collapse and planetary bankruptcy, okay? There isn't any shiny Kurzweil singularity on the horizon. Ray Kurzweil, I don't like to pick fights with him. He's not going to live to be 200, okay? He almost died some time ago. You know, he's afraid of dying, and he's a, he's a, he's a man who's terrified by mortality and, and lavishly bombs his body with multivitamins with no medical control all right that that's that he's a prophet but the guy's an eccentric all right so you know don't go out selling your mom's farm because you somehow think a kurzweil singularity is going to bail you out it ain't going to happen all right you're being a sap now sap now 
you know, in terms of artificial intelligence, I've been super interested in it. It's such a provocative and interesting idea. You know, and I've met people who are involved in this, you know, AI guys, I've like hung out with them. And, you know, I followed their reasoning and I've like read about them for a long time. Okay, you know, you can only make so many ideological and metaphysical arguments before you have to put up and actually cough up some artificial intelligence. Okay, we don't have any. We've got lots of collective intelligence, like Siri. I mean, Siri's super interesting. She talks, you know, you can like ask her questions and even some like really pretty elaborate questions. Okay, you're asking that of a database of human responses. It's like those little devices that answer 20 questions really effectively. Because it's just listened to every possible game of 20 questions 20 million times and you just winnow it down and sort of go for the most frequently asked questions. And you know, that's super powerful. I'd rather have Siri on my side with her vast database of human interactions than some kind of little Turing box that's sitting here on the table saying, hi, I'm conscious. Okay, you are, you actually have. We don't have wandering robots walking around. We're entirely dependent on networks now and clouds. Nobody would dream of building a super device in a, you know, in a Pellegrino bottle. It's just not how we create technology anymore. So, you know, we need to like get over these old paradigms because first, they're not accurate. Second, they've never had any proof on the ground. And third, we don't even use machines like that. That's not the, so, you know, there isn't one future any more than there's one past, right? And even the past isn't closed because the past has to be continually retrodicted. Now, the, the, the events in the past take their meaning from what we think of them now. And that's why you don't have to despair of what happened. You know, you can sort of say, well, you know, this is another day. And I'm going to like remember what has happened and like learn some lesson by that and like affect my behavior. So it isn't closed. But in another way, it is closed because, you know, the dead don't return. They bring their baggage, but once they're gone, they're really gone. So, you know, all about. So, you know, atemporality is something that's like a genuinely arcane creative issue. And it's mostly about our relationship to time and also how we talk about time and how we understand and describe what it is that time does to us. And which means that we don't relate to history through history books anymore. We're now relating through history through looking things up on networks. And th these kinds of digital access things have subtle but profound effects on why we think something happened, what the past means, how we project meaning out of the past, prediction, retrodiction, where we are in a particular scale of progress, what's weird, what's to be expected, what's banal, what's really novel, whether in this problem. We're always talking about the future as if it were the future, even though we have quite a long past. So one of the methods to get around from that is to talk about the future as if it were the past, right? In other words, to talk about these objects as if they were already in a dump in China. Like, oh, I've got this awesome, cool new lash. I was like, high tech, nobody's ever made a film like this before. Okay, your fate, dump in China. Small pieces, dump in China. Now, if I just like make the conjecture that we're already discussing it as a dump in China, now we can actually talk about it in like a fresh way, right? Instead of saying, oh, like, what does it mean for the future? It's like, well, you know, it was like this thing, and like, how big was it? You know, and what did people do with it? And like, what kind of difference did it make? Okay, who specifically used it? You see, once you like have that approach to it, you're like, you are more intimate with it. You're not, you're not, you're, you're not buffaloed by sort of thinking, oh, it's like this thing of profound possibility. It's more like, okay, it's like one among a series of things, and someday that time will be here, and why don't I just use the words that I would have used at this time and push it into this other time, right? So it's just me not this, but I think we're finally, we're, we're closer to really making it happen. I mean, we just have a better understanding of it than we did, you know? We're just, we're, it's like part of the temperament of this time. And, you know, it's a pity that we're older people now and don't have more energy but that's just the nature of creativity, you know. 
once you get really, really good at doing it, you don't want to bother. <laughs> it's, it's true, you know, it's true in any or, you know, what happens after a temporality is a really interesting question. Like what happens when a temporality is an old fashioned attitude? And it will be eventually because, you know, nothing lasts forever, especially ideas about time. Ideas about time are very time bound. So, you know, ideas about time and metaphysicians don't like to hear that. They like to think that truth is eternal. They don't want to think that truth is something generated by systems of meaning and that, you know, and that people can't find absolute truths. Um, but they don't. And you can, you can read the history of people attempting to find absolute truths and there aren't any. I mean, they're just, there is a history of them doing it and, you know, there, there's opinions, but, you know, the absolute truths are not in fact stable and even the past isn't stable. The product of any of the majors, Facebook, Amazon, Microsoft, Google, Apple, you know, these are passing technosocial phenomena and for you to like go out and worship like the glowing Apple thing, like the lamest fanboy in the world, get over yourself, you know, where is your point of view, you know? You really just like, don't, don't bow the knee to that kind of uh, pin-headed geekdom, you know? I don't know. I mean, it's, it's the classic cyberpunk dictum that the future is already here. It's just, it hasn't been distributed. Okay, well, you know, it hasn't been distributed for 40, maybe 50 years <laughs> in the case of... Stuff that's going on you know, I think the new thing about it is social networking. Because you could be a guy while you were doing. And, you know, there really aren't that many regional areas where there's enough of a critical mass of people to appreciate it. But once you have social networking, you can start pulling out the two guys, the five guys, the seven guys, the, the lone genius, and somehow agglomerate them into groups like, uh, you know, Free Art and Technology Lab, which are, you know, 19 guys in probably 25 cities. I haven't tried to count them, but, you know... No I mean, Casey Rees says, you know, code's great at doing five or six things. They're like simulation, replication, you know, recursion. Okay, you know, you can't really do a lot of simulation with a fountain pen, kind of, you know. You can draw somebody's picture, but it doesn't do anything. You know, it doesn't actually behave in the way that another system behaves. So it's like the microbial world, you know, it's like the intricacy of something under a microscope. And... You look at it and you think, you know, gosh, these like small fuzzy things, they really dwell within us. You know, they're kind of pervasive and, uh, you know, and there's a kind of, um, you know, majesty to that, really. So, okay, it's amazing and unheard of from that particular device at this particular moment, but it's not more amazing and unheard of than like somebody in the 1960s doing original graphics stuff on a mainframe computer. That was really amazing. I mean, like... The early kind of Ivan Sutherland devices where he was actually inventing computer graphics. That was super amazing. I mean, you could see like videos of people going in this like, I've never seen anything like this ever. You know, it's like the, it's like the Wright brothers taking off. Okay, that's amazing, right? 